Um, we can get started. People feeling rested? We'll actually take a break, I hope. Okay. So um, there are a few odds and ends that I wanted to go over, and then I felt we just continue going through the content that's going to be of relevance for your first lab three checkout. Just make sure I said record. Um, so first thing I want to just remind people of is I'm going to be asking for your final project proposal in one week. So I'll put an announcement on Canvas through which you can, uh, it'll be an assignment on Canvas through which you can submit a proposal. Uh, you can read about what that proposal should include on the course website. It's a couple of pages that describes the idea and an approximate plan for how you're going to actualize that idea. Given the proximity of the deadline, does anyone want to talk about final projects or final project ideas? Does anyone know what they're doing? No. <laughs> Not yet. Does anyone have an idea of what they might do? Yeah? Do you want to share it? <laughs> you don't have to. Can we schedule a meeting with you? Yes, sure. Yeah. Um, if, if anybody wants to schedule a meeting to talk through an idea, that'd be fine. Or we can just talk through it in lab. Um, we went over a bunch in lecture the other the other day. Yeah. I like the ant one. That one seemed the nice. The ant one. Yeah. The the ant colony optimization visualization. I think that'd be really cool. Um, so uh, as many of you are likely aware, there's a version of the Pico called the Pico W. These are these still hard to get first. I haven't actually looked on. Sure. They're available on DigiKey. Okay. So so there are a bunch of these available. If anybody wanted to do a final project that had sort of an IoT flavor to it, these Pico Ws are exactly the same Picos we've been using um, with the addition of a Wi-Fi chip so that you can give your projects Wi-Fi connectivity. If that kind of thing appeals to anybody, um, there are a bunch of great, great projects you could do with that capability. And also, if you did a good job documenting that Wi-Fi capability, it would certainly become a part of this course documentation. I, th I think in coming years, it'd be pretty cool to do an IoT flavored lab in this class using the W. I just didn't get to it this year. Okay. Anything else people want to mention or talk about? Yeah. What's the budget for the final project? The budget for the final project is usually what, $125? Oh. Okay. So so I will I will confirm that number for you. It's gonna be something on the order of a hundred ish bucks total. A subset of which we will cover, and the rest, if you wanted to go all the way up to the full amount, you would have to cover. There, there is an upper limit on the total cost of the project because we don't want folks for to like to you know go buy a motorcycle and bring it into lab and start trying to outfit a motorcycle or something crazy. Um, so there's an upper limit to that. They said that we bring this back. Like, it's like drawn, like, like, would you like an optimization one as well? Okay. <laughs> Anything else? Final projects. Okay. So this week in lab, I think what I'll do is, you know, as we're going through and working on lab three, I'll sit down with each group and just kind of kick around a few ideas with people, see what folks are thinking. Like I recommended before, if you're if you're totally at a loss for what you might like to do, start with a list of stuff you're curious about. And you don't have to know anything about these things. A list of stuff you're curious about, a list of things you like to do. It doesn't have to be related to engineering at all. We can likely come up with some sort of a project that would allow for you to explore that hobby or uh, learn more about that thing that you're interested in. Okay, if anything occurs to anyone, just let me know. But in that case, I want to just remind you what we were doing. So. We started last week going through the content that's going to be relevant for your first week's checkout. I'll just remind you that your first week's checkout involves building the motor circuit and interfacing the motor with that circuit and doing open loop control of the motor through that circuit, which is to say you specify a duty cycle to your PWM input to the motor and then that makes the motor turn. Uh, and then there's going to be some expectation on data visualization as well. So you'll be asked to 
interface the sensor with the processor and put the complementary filter output up on the VGA screen. So last time, let me just pull up the course website. Last time what we talked about was the motor circuit that you're going to be building. This circuit in particular. I want to make one correction to this. I'm going to update this web page uh, sometime today. But uh, in talking with Bruce about this afterwards, the correction I'm going to make is to move this, this capacitor, instead of being across the power supply, to put it directly across the motor. And I think we'll get better noise attenuation if we do that. So I'll update this diagram today, but if you're in this afternoon's lab section, I probably won't have it updated by then. So please just put the cap directly across the motor. Oh, there's something else I wanted to mention. Is Michael in here? Yeah. So Michael figured out how to overclock this thing to 428 megahertz. Uh, and if folks are interested in trying this, we're, we're well beyond voids. Please stop working on voids if you're still working on voids. Uh, but if, you know, you have a quiet evening and you're still sort of being kept up at night thinking about voids optimizations and you want to try overclocking it a little bit more, um, I'll put that, the documentation that you found on the course website so that people can find it. The, the trick, as it turns out, is the interface to the external flash where your program memory lives. Remember that when you program the Pico, your program code is going onto that external flash memory and is being communicated to some local cache on board the RP20 or on board the, uh, that communicates directly with the arms via this QSPI channel. The top speed of that QSPI connection is, I believe, 300 megahertz. And so that ends up being the limiting, the, the, the throttle on your overclocking. There is uh, an option where in your CMake file, you can add a couple of commands to put a clock divider on that interface so that you can slow that interface down relative to the system clock, which allows you to turn the system clock up even higher and maintain a connection to the external flash memory. There are also incidentally tricks that you can do to, to tell the compiler, I would like for this section of code to be stored locally in cache. And that can speed things up as well. We didn't talk much about that optimization, but I'll, I can do some documentation and talk about that in a coming lecture if folks are interested. Um, okay, so unless there are any other questions, I'm going to carry on with this conversation about um, lab three. The first thing that I'll mention is you're asked to do the mechanical construction of this arm this week. And that whole process is documented on this web page. All that I want to point out about this process, it's not hard. Putting this thing together is not hard, but please be careful to do it in the correct order. And the only reason for that is all of the connections for this thing are mechanical, and that's so that we can put it together and take it apart a bunch of times easily. But if you put, it, if you put this together in the wrong order, you can put it together in such a way that you can't take it apart again. <laughs> that would be annoying. Uh, so, for instance, if you attach the motor in a certain way with your wing nuts on one side instead of the other side, and then you pop the reaction wheel on, suddenly you can no longer get to the wing nuts to actually remove the thing. Um, and then the other thing that I wanted to mention about the mechanical construction is everything is held together via nuts and bolts and wing nuts and such, with the exception of the reaction wheel, which is press fit onto the motor here. So there's a little interface there for the motor and we, we press fit the reaction wheel onto that. I just want to warn you that that is a tight fit. It will fit, but it's, a, it's quite a tight fit. And if you'd like to make it a little bit easier to get it on, I have a bunch of files in the lab and you can just file out that socket a little bit further and you'll, you'll be able to slide it in a little easier. Um, or alternatively, a suggestion from Smith, Smith Charles who designed these wheels for us, um, something he suggested also is if you take some, a pencil and just color the inside of the socket with the pencil, graphite is a dry lubricant and it'll help it slide on a bit better. So that's something else you might try. Um, once you get it on, please don't take it off. And the only reason for that is experimentation shows that it's kind of easy given the tightness of this connection to just rip the wheel apart. <laughs> so, um, I will carefully remove them at the end of the semester, but once, uh, just given the number that we have, once you press fit it on, just leave it on. And we'll find a place to store it. Okay. Questions about this? I'll have everything sort of arrayed on the uh, soldering bench so that you can just come up and grab stuff. <laughs> 
Okay, and I laser cut 50 of these arms this weekend, so we should have fun. So in that case, what I want to talk about next is the pulse width modulation peripheral on the RP2040. Let me just pull up the data sheet. I'm going to talk about this from the data sheet. Um, so let me just briefly remind you, I've been trying to sort of revisit this diagram now and again throughout the semester just to keep stepping back and reminding ourselves what we're doing here. What we're doing in this class generally is just kind of walking through the various hardware peripherals and bells and whistles that are available in here. And at this point, after having completed lab two, we've experimented with both processors, because most of you did multi-core stuff for lab two, and you all definitely did it for lab one, so you've experimented with both processors. You've at least been exposed to the DMA channels, whether or not you've manipulated these yourself or not, okay, but perhaps you will in, the, in a final project, but you've been exposed to how the DMA works. You're, you're obviously interacting with all the memory here. Uh, we talked extensively about these PIO coprocessors. This is how we're driving the VGA screen. It's PIO processors and some DMA channels is our interface to the VGA. Um, we've talked through the ADC in lab one. We've talked through the UART. We've talked through the SPI channel. That's how we communicated to the DAC in lab one. We've talked through G the GPIO manipulation. Many of you have played a little bit with the PLL for overclocking. So we've talked a little bit about that. Um, what I want to talk about today is the pulse width modulation hardware peripheral here, which we haven't gotten to yet. And you'll, you'll be relieved to learn after having spent the last week or so really down in the weeds with this PIO subsystem. PWM is mercifully simple. So, so we'll talk, there's, there's a few interesting features of this that I think warrants me actually <laughs> talking about it, some vocabulary that's specific to this architecture that I think is worth me going through, but, but it, it's really rather simple. So we'll talk through this for lab three, and then the sensor that we're using, it's the MPU 6050, it's an accelerometer and a gyroscope. The interface to that sensor is an I2C interface. So we'll also talk through I2C for lab three. Um, I might have chosen a different sensor with, you know, an SPI peripheral or, or interface or something, but I chose this in part because it has an I2C interface, simply because then it's a good excuse for us to cover this peripheral in addition to the other ones. So, with all that said, let me go to the pulse width modulation chapter here, which is right here. Oh, look at how mercifully short. <laughs> Okay. Let's look at the pulse width modulation chapter. So, on the RP2040, you can, you can send a pulse width modulation signal out to any of the GPIO ports. So you can map a pulse width modulation signal to any GPIO port. That said, you don't have, you don't have, you cannot map 30 independent PWM signals to all of the different GPIO ports. The, what you have are eight, what they call PWM slices. Why they chose to use the word slices, I'm not sure. <laughs> I'm not sure why that's the case. But there are eight PWM slices that are fully independent. So these are fully independent pieces of PWM peripheral that you can configure totally independently. The eight of these slices each of those slices can drive two PWM output signals through two GPIO ports. So for each slice, you can configure the period of that PWM signal, and then the two PWM outputs attached to that slice will each have the same period, but they might have different duty cycles. You can independently configure the duty cycles for them, but they'll be in phase with one another. And then somewhat Incidentally, probably for you all, but what's interesting to note is so you have eight, eight PWM slices. Each one controls two GPIO, can control two GPIO outputs. This is a table showing you which GPIOs match to which PWM slices and channels. So, for instance, GPIO zero is PWM slice zero output A. GPIO one is PWM slice zero output B. So those are the two PWM outputs that PWM slice zero can manipulate. Each of these, because they're on the same slice, will have the same period, but output A and output B might have different duty cycles. 
So in lab three, you could set this up however you want to set it up. You, you might choose to set up, uh, you need two PWM outputs to control the H bridge that drives the motor, right? So you might choose to have one of those PWM outputs on one slice and another one on the other slice. It seems like the easiest thing to do to me is you choose two GPIO outputs that are on the same PWM slice. Then you know that those two PWM signals are in phase with one another, and you can independently modulate the duty cycle of each of them to control the speed and direction of the motor. That means I think the easiest path forward. We'll look at that in code in just a second. But okay, so GPIO zero is slice zero output A, one is slice zero output B, GPIO two is slice one output A, and so on and so on and so on, all the way up to GPIO 15, and then what this, what this data sheet tells us is this whole table then repeats for the rest of the GPIO outputs. So for instance, GPIO 16 is also PWM channel or slice zero output A, 17 is slice zero output B. So for PWM slice zero, you could multiply, you could add its, its A output to either GPIO zero or GPIO 16 or both. And if you map it to both, then an identical PWM signal appears on both the GPIO outputs. You can't control them independently. They'll have the same period, they'll have the same duty cycle, but you get the same PWM output on both GPIOs. <coughs> maybe that's useful. I don't know, I'm trying, to, I'm trying to come up for applications where maybe that's useful. If, if you want to guarantee that the PWM signal that you're sending to, to two things, maybe it's two motors or whatever it may be, are the same, that's kind of a handy feature. Or maybe you just keep one always hooked up to a scope pro or something. I don't know, maybe that's handy. Um, so just to summarize, what that means is, any GPIO can have a PWM output. There are eight PWM slices, each of which can have a totally different period, a totally different duty cycle. Each of those slices maps to two output channels. Those two output channels will have the same period but might have different duty cycles. And furthermore, if you want, you can have two copies of each output channel, which will have the same period and the same duty cycle. What I recommend for you all in lab three is pick a slice, a PWM slice, have one of your H bridge control signals be output A from that slice, have the other one be output B from that slice. They'll have the same period, they'll be in phase with one another, but you can independently control their duty cycles. That I think is the easiest way to set things up because then you can set up uh, an interrupt to fire every time you complete a PWM period and you know that you've completed a period on both channels, you know that they're in phase. So in that interrupt service routine, you can go in and modify the duty cycle of each one, and you're doing so synchronously with one another. Um, perhaps it's worth me just briefly reminding you what a PWM channel is doing. There, there are different options here that make for tables that look slightly different than this, but sort of the, the canonical PWM channel what it is composed of is some counter that just counts up to some threshold. You configure that threshold. That's what sets the period of the PWM signal. It's actually, it's in a register called top, which is to say the top of this curve here. You configure what that number is that it counts up to. And then once in, in this mode, once it counts up to that number, it resets to zero and counts up to it again. And it is constantly comparing the value of this incrementing counter to the value in a separate register called the counter compare level. And in the event that the value of the counter is less than this threshold, then the output of the PWM signal is high. In the event that the value of this counter is greater than this threshold, then the output is low. So you could see that by playing with the height of this compare threshold, we vary the duty cycle which is to say the percent of the, the, the fraction of the period for which this square weight is high. You play with that by playing with the level of this. And then by playing with the value of that top register, 
we play with the period of this signal. There are actually two degrees of freedom for controlling the period of this. One is the value of that top register, and the other one is by playing with the clock divider attached to the PWM channel. You can slow down this timer relative to the system clock if you care to, if you want to be able to achieve periods that are longer than would be achievable if this thing were ticking at 125 megahertz or whatever it may be. Incidentally, this counting variable here, you, you have 16 bits to spend. So you can count up to numbers as high as 2 to the 16 minus 1. So sort of three degrees of freedom here. Value of this, value of this, and clock divider. And with those three degrees of freedom, you specify the period of this square wave, the duty, and the duty cycle of this square wave. This particular PWM peripheral, we're not going to use this feature of this in, um, in lab three, but in addition to being able to generate pulse width modulation outputs, you can also use this, this peripheral to measure as an input, you set it up as an input, and you can measure the frequency or the duty cycle of a PWM input. That's pretty handy. Because there's a whole family of sensors where the information coming out of the sensor is encoded in the duty cycle of some square wave. Right? So reading that via, what would you say, conventional means probably requires setting up some sort of an input capture module so that when you see a rising edge, you grab the value of the timer, right? So that you're measuring how long is this, this whole, how long is this high and how long is the whole period. There's some work involved, right? This, if you set it up as an input and use it to measure, oh, say, duty cycle, then you could just directly measure sensors like this. Again, we're not going to use that in lab three, but some of you might find that useful depending on sort of what other projects you might be working on. Um, each of these slices has a, a DMA interface and an interrupt interface. We're going to be using the interrupt interface. Uh, what we're going to be doing in lab three is setting up a slice of this PWM channel with two outputs for controlling the H bridge. And every time we complete one period of that PWM output, we're going to go into an interrupt service routine, take a measurement off the sensor, compute a control input, which looks like a modification of the duty cycle, modify the duty cycle, and then wait and do it again the next time we complete one period of the square wave. And our PWM signal is going to be running at one kilohertz, right? So we have plenty of time to get in and out of interrupts there. It's not some crazy high frequency um, square wave. It's, it's a kilohertz. I mentioned that uh, there are other, some, some other sort of modes and features of this. One is, if you wanted to, you could configure in the previous graphic we were looking at, this was counting up and then overflowing back down to zero and then counting up again. You could alternatively configure this such that it counts up and then counts down and then counts up again. You have to think about that. You have to remember that because it's doing this, that, uh, that um, halves the output frequency, right? So you have to account for that when you're setting frequencies. But what is kind of nice about this is the output of your square wave is always centered right here so that the phase stays constant as you play with duty cycle. Depending on what application you're working on, maybe you care about such a thing, right? And this would allow for you to control for that. Um, the, other, the other things that you can do with this particular PWM peripheral is you can do phase advancing and phase retarding. So this counting variable, you can bump it forward one step at a time or pull it back one step at a time so that you can play with the phase of two PWM signals if you want to. And we're not going to do that for lab three, but it's interesting stuff to do for final projects, I think. Um, the other thing to be aware of is those two registers that I were talk was talking about as being the, the primary ones through which we're manipulating the period and the duty cycle of these signals. 
the top register and the counter compare register, those are double buffered. So if they weren't double buffered, what we would have to worry about is, suppose we're partway through here and we change the compare level, what we would see on the output is some glitch for one period when the compare level changes and then things would stabilize again. We would get a glitch on the output of our PWM if there was not a double buffer. And we'd see a similar glitch in the event that we changed the value of that top register. And so we'd see, we'd see a glitch like this where you know, it's moving along and then because we move this, we see a funny thing happen on the output here. Because these are double buffered, there's actually two copies of the top register, two copies of the counter compare register. What that means is you can go in and modify one or the other of them, and that modification doesn't take effect until one period of this output waveform has completed, which is to say on falling edges. So that means you never get glitches on the output. It's a really nice feature, actually. I already mentioned the clock divider, so you can, you can slow down that counter relative to the system clock if you want to, and in fact you will in lab three, because we want for the period of this to be at one kilohertz, which compared to the system clock is, is very slow, so we actually have to slow down the PWM peripheral relative to the system clock. Um, and then like I mentioned, we can use this as an input sensor as well, and the way that this works sort of at a slightly lower level is instead of configuring that counter in to be in free running mode, which is to say it just counts up, 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 up. You can instead configure it to only increment on some condition. Maybe it's on the ri on rising edges of some input pin or on falling edges of some input pin, or um, it can increment in a way that's related to the logical level of an input pin so that you can measure duty cycle. When you set up one of these PWM channels, it is automatically put into output mode. If you then go in and change the, the clock divider mode to something other than free running, it becomes an input. Because the only reason you would ever want to do that is if you were using this PWM interface as an input to measure frequency or duty cycle. So then it automatically becomes an input pin. Otherwise, it's just an output. OK. And then there's a bunch of registers here. So let's. After taking sort of a cursory glance through there, let's just take a look at um, some of the PWM demo code for this week. So there are two examples in the Lab3 directory. One's called PWM demo. In this demo, uh, as we'll see in just a moment, we set up one pulse width modulation channel. We set up one pulse width modulation slice, and we set up one of the output channels associated with that slice. And then through a serial interface, the user can specify the duty cycle that they want for that PWM signal, and it'll automatically take effect. When you, you know, I want a 50% duty cycle, click, and then you get a 50% duty cycle on the output. The other demo here, which we'll talk about probably next time, um, but it'll be relevant to you for, for week one, honestly. This is, um, you hook up the sensor to the RP2040, the MPU6050 IMU and, and accelerometer, and what this demo does is read the sensor and plot the raw accelerometer and gyroscope measurements kind of in an oscilloscope way on the VGA screen. So this is a really nice starting point for getting your complementary filter working. Well, let's look at the PWM demo quickly. And there's not much going on here. Some familiar looking includes. Um, some familiar looking high level libraries, a couple of lower level hardware interface libraries. The only new one that we haven't seen before is pwm.h, right? So we've included hardware slash pwm.h, which means if we were to look in the CMake file, we would see that library linked. Right? And then um, let's just scroll down here and look at main. So initialize stdio. Um, we, we, map GPIO5 to its PWM functionality. So remember like in lab one, when we were setting up the SPI channel, we mapped a particular set of GPIO pins to their SPI functionality. So in this case, we're, we're saying, I would like to 
have, P, have GPIO5 controlled and manipulated by the PWM peripheral, as opposed to any of the other hardware peripherals or as opposed to the SIO, right? We're going to instead have PWM peripheral control GPIO5. In this case, we're calling a, an SDK function, PWM GPIO to slice number, to figure out which of those, P, which of those PWM slices is GPIO5 attached to. We could go into the data sheet and look at that table that we were just looking at and just look this up and we would know it. This is just essentially allowing for us to be a little bit lazy. It's, it's a function that we can call that tells us which slice that GPIO is attached to. The next thing that we do here is we're setting up an interrupt to fire every time we complete one period of this PWM signal. So the first thing that we do is we Clear the interrupt associated with that GPIO slice, or with that PWM slice rather. We clear the interrupt. We call PWM set interrupt enabled. Just to say we enable the particular PWM interrupt attached to the slice to which the GPIO we're using is connected. We set it to true, which is just to say enable it, turn it on. <coughs> we then call an SDK function from the, the interrupt interface library that allows for us to attach a function to a particular interrupt. So in this case, the particular interrupt is PWM ERC wrap, which is to say this is, this is the interrupt that gets fired when the PWM signal wraps. The counter counts all the way up and then goes back to zero. So that's the name of the interrupt, <coughs> something from the data sheet. And what we're saying is every time you see this interrupt get thrown, call this function, which we'll look at in just a second, but it's declared right up here. So that every time we complete one period of the PWM, we're gonna call this function that we'll look at in just a second. And then we turn on that particular interrupt. We then do some configuration of this particular PWM uh, output. So in particular, we're setting the wrap value. This is that top register, right? So we're setting the value at which we would like for the counter to stop counting up and reset and start counting again. This is essentially, these two things are setting the period of the PWM signal. So we're setting the wrap value, the, the wrap value here to some value that we'll look at in a second that we've found to find to call wrap value. And likewise, we're setting the clock divider to something that we're calling clock div. Let's just look at those for a second and justify them. So wrap val is 5,000, clock div is 25. So that means we're going to increment that counting variable at 125 divided by 25 hertz. Megahertz, rather. So at 5 megahertz in real time math and see if I make mistakes. So we're dividing this PWM down by 25. So now instead of incrementing the, the counter 125 million times a second, we're incrementing it 5 million times a second. And we're setting the wrap valve to 5,000, which is to say, wrap that counter, start counting up again when you get to the number 5,000. So that's, that's, Let's see, that's 125 million, one, two, three, four, five, six, divided by 25, divided by 5,000 is one kilohertz. So with a clock divider of 25, setting the wrap value to 5,000 means that we will wrap that counter 1,000 times a second at one kilohertz. We then call another SDK function, PWM set channel level. This is configuring, this is configuring, this counter compare level. That's the level that it's talking about. So it's essentially setting the duty cycle, right? And we're setting it to some value. 3,125, just to some randomly chosen value, which is to say that the duty cycle will be 
3,125 divided by uh, 5,000. We turn on the PWM channel, and then we add a thread here. Before we look at the thread, let's just go up and look at that. Remember that this is the function that gets called every time that interrupt gets thrown, so a thousand times a second this gets called. First thing we do is clear that interrupt. We then compare the values of two variables that we'll look at in just a second. One's called control, the other's called old control. When we look at the serial thread, we'll see that this is the, the variable where we're storing information about the duty cycle that the user wants. And what we're asking is, has the user entered a new duty cycle? In the event that the user has entered a new duty cycle, we update the value of the old control variable with that new value. And then we call that SDK function that we were just looking at to reconfigure the duty cycle for this PWM channel. And remember that because this is double buffer, there will be no glitch on the output. We'll call this the, the PWM output completes a cycle. This gets called, we update the, the duty cycle of the PWM channel, and on the next period, it's at, it's at its new duty cycle. This supports duty cycles of zero and 100%, incidentally. So you can say zero, and it will just stay low. You can say 100% you can say duty cycle, and it will just stay high. And then there's one thread in this project. Obviously, it starts with the PT begin, ends with the PT end. We have one static int declared in here called test int. We're prompting the user for a number between 0 and 5,000. Why a number between 0 and 5,000? Because remember that we set our wrap value to 5,000. So we're counting up as high as 5,000. So the user can set the value of that counter compare register to some number in that range. So we're asking for a number between 0 and 5,000. Do a, a serial write, remember that this is the non-blocking printf. Do a serial read, which is the non-blocking um, um, macro for doing user input. The user specifies some number. We take that number, which ends up landing in pt serial in buffer, and we put it into the test in static in. We do a quick check here to see if the user has given us an out of range number. If it's greater than 5,000, just don't do anything with it. If it's less than zero, just don't do anything with it. Otherwise, set the value of this variable control equal to the value that the user just input. Once the value of control gets updated, this condition will be satisfied, assuming that we've entered some different value. This condition will be satisfied. We'll update the value of this old control variable. So the next time we interrupt, this assuming that the user hasn't given any further input, this condition is not satisfied. And we update the value of the duty cycle. Yeah. If it's double buffered, why do we need the interrupt service routine? Why can't we put that in the same thread? You could. You could. Um, the interrupt ser in this example, the interrupt service routine is here because the you want for your controller's timing to be precise. Um, so this is setting us up to move in that direction. So this, as I just mentioned, this is configuring it's initializing one PWM slice, slice two, incidentally. We can look at the data sheet to justify that. And it is manipulating one of the output channels, particularly output channel B of that GPIO slice. Suppose you wanted to also manipulate output channel A. Which GPIO would that be attached to? Well, let's just take a look here. So we are manipulating GPIO 5. That's, that's PWM slice 2 output B. Suppose that you wanted for the two H-bridge motor controls to be output channels A and B from the same PWM slice and say, you, you know, you just wanted to stick with slice two. Well, in that case, what you would do is you'd say, I'm going to configure my other PWM output, the other input to the H bridge to be on GPIO four, which is PWM slice two output channel A. Make sense. Okay. 
So for our purposes, for a PWM signal, there's, there's two degrees of freedom that we care about. There's period and there's duty cycle. You, you set up the period once and that never changes. And you set it up in particular by configuring the clock divider and the wrap value such that your counting variable wraps a thousand times a second. We're going we're gonna to control these motors at a kilohertz, right? So it's those two parameters that configure the period of the pulse width modulation output. And then the duty cycle is your control input, right? So in this example that we just looked at, the user enters some, some value for the duty cycle and just automatically gets set to be whatever you entered it for it to be. Um, ultimately, in lab three, that will be a number that is computed via a PID controller. So what you will do is you're going to use <laughs> the accelerometer and gyroscope to figure out what angle the arm is presently <laughs> sitting at. You look at the difference between the current arm angle and the desired arm angle, which is straight up. And then using a PID controller, the details of which we'll talk about in, in lecture, but what the PID controller does is as an input, it takes that error in angle. And as an output, it gives you a duty cycle. A duty cycle and sign, right? Which is to say, I want for the motor to spin this fast and in this direction. Okay, with people. I can't tell if people are bored because this is so easy or just like. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's the first. I mean, the PWM is something that's not really mysterious to folks, right? You would have been exposed to this a couple of times. Yes, it, it, it works if you've used PWM before to control DC motors and stuff. It, ha it has all the configurations that you would expect for it to have, right? And the CSDK makes it quite easy to manipulate all of those various parameters. Uh, you could go in and, as always, you could go in and you could touch the registers yourself, do low levels of register manipulations to do all these configurations that way. Um, it's just harder, right? It's, it's easier to make mistakes. So the SDK abstracts that away like everything else. Okay. <laughs> in that case, the, the next, another piece of the puzzle that we have to fill in here is I2C communication. Um, and this, kind of like SPI, kind of like UART, there's, there's two conversations to be had here. One is, how does the I2C protocol work? Forget about the RP2040, just, you know, how is it that I2C actually works? What's the protocol? And then, what does I2C on the RP2040 look like? So I think probably what makes sense is to have the conversation about the protocol first and then look at the RP2040 documentation and some examples to see how we manipulate the I2C peripheral on this particular chip. So let me, we're going to run out of time partway through this, this conversation and that's okay, we'll just pick it up next time. But let me start by introducing it in, by showing you a picture that is sort of reminiscent to the one that I showed you for SPI. So suppose that you are hooking up a number of I2C devices to, you know, one another. Some of these might be sensors and some of these might be processors that are reading or controlling the sensors. Um, one of the advantages you could say of I2C is that there is there are significantly less wires connecting all of the devices on this bus, less than, for instance, SPI. So you remember that for SPI, we had a clock line, we had a MOSI line, which was data going from the controlling device out to the peripheral devices. We had a MISO line, which was data coming in the opposite direction. And we had a chip select line, which was the mechanism by which we indicated which of these peripheral devices we wanted to communicate with. And that we had to indicate that because they're all sharing the same data lines. So in order to keep things from getting confused, we needed this extra digital line to just say I'm talking to you as opposed to you. Um, there is no such chip select line on the on an I2C bus, and likewise, 
SEL is definitely here. This is to indicate a clock line. SDA is to indicate a data line. You can see that there aren't two data lines. On SPI, we had data going this direction and data going this direction. That's not the case on I2C. There's only one data line, which perhaps suggests a true fact about this, which is not, it's not full duplex. Remember, SPI, we, we sent data this way and this way simultaneously. And in fact, we had to. That's, that's baked into the way that the SPI protocol works, is that you're communicating data in both directions all the time. I2C, say controller two here wants to talk to, I don't know, peripheral one, it'll send a message that's received by everybody that says, uh, I would like to communicate with peripheral one. So that's going to include an address, right? All these devices will have different addresses. We've talked about this, but the first message sent from a device that wants to communicate with one of the peripherals is, I would like to communicate with the peripheral with this particular address. That will be received by all these peripherals, but only the one with that address will respond. And we'll talk about the mechanism by which that response occurs. And then there's a series of back and forth exchanges between the controlling device and the peripheral device where data is sent this way, and it's sent this way, and it's sent this way, right? So what, what that correctly suggests is this is going to be slower than SPI, right? Because we have to negotiate communication back and forth across a shared data line. So you might call the reduced number of required I.O. ports. Perhaps that's an advantage of I2C over SPI. Right? The speed, you might call a disadvantage of I2C over SPI. Um, the other thing that we'll see here in just a moment is I find I2C a little bit trickier to debug on the scope. The, the, we'll see the timing diagrams in a second, but the timing diagrams are a little bit less just blatantly obvious what's going on than on a SPI channel where there's just clock, data this way, data that way, chips like it, it's all perfectly clear, really. I2C is a little bit more cryptic. It's not horrible. And I'll mention, incidentally, that each of your benches has two scopes. There's the scope that we everybody's been using, and then there's that little blue Pico scope, which is all software controlled. That has a serial decoder on it. So if you want to debug uh, an I2C interface, that can be a handy tool. It'll decode you know, all the waveforms into actual messages. Um, I guess you could say the other advantage is if you have a two channel scope, you got the whole story right there. <laughs> SPI, you kind of need like a four channel scope to see the whole picture, but eh, two channel scope on an I2C. <laughs> Bus, you, you kind of got the whole picture of what's going on. Okay. So, what does an I2C transaction look like? Okay, so what you can see is that by default, both the clock and data lines are being gently pulled high by pull-up resistors. Right? So when no when no communication is taking place, both clock and data are high. And then suppose one of these controlling devices wants to communicate with a peripheral. The way that it says I am taking control of the bus now is with a start condition. What a start condition looks like is the data line transitioning from high to low while the clock line remains high. That is a start condition. And when that, when that happens, what that means is whatever device uh, generated this start condition is now in control of the bus. Nobody else will be able to generate a start condition after one has occurred before it sees a, a stop condition, which we'll talk about in just a moment. But that is the signal that releases the bus to other devices to do communication. Okay, so this is the start condition. Say, say two controlling devices both try to do a transaction. Whichever one gets this condition done first wins. That one is just the one that gets to, 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 to control the bus for a while. After this start condition occurs, all the peripherals on the bus will expect to see nine clock pulses. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine clock pulses. The data will be valid when the clock is high and it changes when the clock is low. So every peripheral will look at the clock line and when it sees logic high value, it goes and gets a bit off the data line. The first one, two, three, four, five, six, seven of those bits is going to be the address of the device that the controlling 
uh, the, the controlling device wants to talk to. So every peripheral device on the bus will have a different address. This is the address of the device with which we want to communicate. The eight o'clock pulse is read write information. Do I want to read information from that device or am I going to write some sort of controller configuration information to that device? And then on the final clock pulse here, the controlling device relinquishes control to the peripheral device. And if the peripheral device with this particular address has, has heard and understood that it is about to be communicated with and it's ready to go, what it will do is hold the, the data line low for this last clock pulse. If the message has been, for whatever reason, misunderstood or not understood correctly, then this will get pulled high by the pull-up resistor for this last clock pulse, and that is an indication that message was not received, which usually means try again, right, or fix some error. So you can see one, two, three, four, five, six, seven bits in the address. That suggests that in principle you should be able to put, what, 128 different peripheral devices on an I2C bus. Um, in principle, I suppose you could. What we're going to find, we're going to look at a few sort of case study data sheets is usually, I would say, in my experience, it's the case that you have either no freedom to configure this address yourself or extremely limited freedom. You might be able to pick between like one or two addresses. Uh, in the case of the M the, the 6050 that we're using, the, the accelerometer gyroscope, there is an additional pin where you can change between one of two addresses by setting that pin high or low. So that means that you could have up to two of these IMUs on the same I2C bus, but not more because then devices would have the same address. And there are a lot of other devices that uh, have no configuration at all. You just, it's whatever address, address you're stuck with. And by the way, if you buy device A and that manufacturer happens to have chosen the same default address as device B, you can't put them on the same I2C bus. Unless you implement something like a chip select, in which case you're kind of losing the advantage of I2C to begin with, right? Um, so yeah, in principle, this suggests a whole lot of stuff could go on these buses. In, in practice, you gotta read the data sheets to see how much freedom you actually have over changing the addresses of the devices that you want to talk to. Okay, we'll continue this conversation the next time.